<laughs> All right. Well, Lynn Walder, lifecoaching.com. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it so very much. You are not in the United States. You are in the UK, Nottingham, correct? I am, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so excited that we can do this, that we can just like you know, communicate thousands of miles away. And um, just thank you. That, this means so much to me. Um, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure to talk with you. And we are in this pandemic that have people, everyone all over the world, their lives just changing drastically. Now, the reason I want to talk with you is because first of all, I think you're a wonderful person. Secondly, you have, <laughs> you are a psychotherapist. So you have a whole insight as to what's going on into people and people you know, need to really tune into themselves and you help people do that to help them find their best, their best person of who they are and how to live that kind of life. And I, I really just want to get your insight as to what the hell is going on and how people can deal with it and know that life is still okay. And, and you, you, you have a way of bringing out the inspiration within a person you know, you inspire them to inspire themselves. And I love that about you. That's very and, kind of you to say so, Sophie, yeah. <laughs> well, so I just, um, so thank you. And I have to ask, what is going on in Nottingham? Man, it's like, where do I start? I actually, I actually, in order for me to process all of this myself, I write things down, I just let it flow. And some of the things... I write down are a little bit out there, but it's my way of processing it as well because what we are seeing is a complete, our lives have been turned completely upside down, but it's like in the flick of the switch. So it's not happened gradually. And what's really amazed me about the whole thing is just how quickly globally people can go from living their life in a certain way to then flipping to living in a completely unnatural way, one that they've never ever experienced before, but they can do it instantly. So they are able to do that when it's a choice between life or death, because essentially that's what it feels like right now. This is serious. And so what it's illustrated to me is actually people can change if they want to, you know? Yes, they've been kind of forced to do it. It's been um, put, up, put upon them by the governments and there, there've been, there's rules and regulations in place about what people can do. But people wouldn't have chosen to make those choices had they not been in a situation that demanded them to follow those new rules, etc. Because one thing, I, I, one thing that's consistent with clients that I work with is generally people fear change. They will do anything to avoid it. And yet, unless you, you know, I talk about the comfort zone and people love to be in their comfort zone. It's safe, it's secure, it's familiar, it's known. Um, they can preempt what's gonna happen, they've got control. But if you stay in the comfort zone, you never grow. There's no room to grow. You just stagnate, really, and then you die. And what this whole situation has given us the opportunity to do is to, well, we're being catapulted out of the comfort zone, whether we like it or not. And we're into the, the next zone is the learning zone, but the zone around that is the panic zone. So I'm imagining... I know a, a lot of people have shot right into the panic zone because it's so un, unfamiliar to them, this whole way of life. And one of the major things I suspect that's created this, this um, real unease about people having to live in this way is there are fewer distractions in their day to day. We've all had to hit the pause button. We've all had to slow down. And actually we're being forced to sit with ourselves. And I absolutely love it. And that it's terrifies really people, right? <laughs> but it terrifies people, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah. like, oh my God, 
<laughs> right? Uh, okay. I so when they get to that point where they are where they are scared, where they are scared, you know, what then? I mean, how you know, people are getting angry, people are getting, you know, they're, you know, threatening people, they're, you know, becoming violent or they're becoming just so angry and being bullies on, you know, social media or how how can people just like really tune inside and and say, hey, this is okay, this is part of the process. How how can it become a safer zone again? You see, they don't know how to. They've never been, they've never known how to, they've never been shown how to. They don't teach this in school, which is something that I do. I'm I'm passionate about teaching young people, children. I work in a university right now on how to be comfortable with uncomfortable emotions, how to sit with that discomfort, that unpleasantness, that pain sometimes, but also to, to encourage them to have a, a vocabulary around that so they can, they can verbalize what's going on for them and to sit with the sensations in their bodies that they've been, you know, people spend a whole lifetime running away from their own feelings. They spend a whole, they create a, a quite, amazing um, strategies to avoid and, and that's what addictions are all about you know everything that you do or we do is to achieve a feeling or to avoid a feeling um, and it's going to it's really really uncomfortable when you are forced to face your feelings you know I had one client when she was so busy, busy is another one of those things that people do to avoid their feelings. And when so many people are busy in this modern society, but that's a symptom of something else. It's not because our lives demand that of us. It's because we choose to be distracted by all of these things because it serves a purpose. It protects us. It keeps us from those unpleasant feelings. So this one client I had, she was busy, 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 stressed. What can I do? Help me. And I prescribed for her 15 minutes each day of just sitting, looking out the window, staring out the window, not doing anything. And she was so horrified. The terror on her face was unbelievable. She says, I can't do that. I, I just can't do it. What if I feel my life has been worthless. What if I realize I've made the wrong choices? What if I don't know the way forward? And it was like, wow, this is what people are running from. And this is what this situation has forced a lot of people into. Within that situation, there are probably a lot of people who have resorted to those behaviors that again, distract them or change their feelings like alcohol, overeating, binge watching TV or movies, you know. Um, but the, the behaviors that you referred to, Sophia, the, the anger and the bullying, etc. If you can step back from that and see the behaviors themselves as a symptom and look behind the behaviors, you get a real insight into that person, that individual. It's almost like you are seeing their internal world. Because thought that anger, that bullying, that that aggressiveness, whatever, is is their frightened response to what's happening in the world, and they're not in control of it, and so they're seeking to control somehow. It's that ego. It's coming from a place of ego, um, and you, it's it's fascinating to watch it all around. It's, it's hard not to get pulled into it when you see injustice or, you know, people being mean to each other. It's hard to not get pulled into the emotion of that. But actually, to be mindful and just be aware that, wow, that person's got some stuff going on for them and they're demonstrating it. It's like children. You know, when children can't express themselves emotionally, they will behave, they will act out. And that's what we're seeing from, from our, our leaders, our so-called leaders as well. Man, I don't want to get into politics. No. <laughs> but, <hey. laughs> but, you know, I, I can't help but think that when each one of us really faces our inner self, you know, face, chooses to face whatever darkness there may be or whatever shadows. I mean, that's not even necessarily ours. That could be, you know, 
down the generations, you know, something that we just kind of like were born into. Yeah, but we, we can fa- inherited it. Right, and, but we can face it and take responsibility for how we're feeling and how we react to it and shift that energy within us. I, I think that could just change the whole planet. It yeah. will change the whole planet. And that's what I think the turning point is. That's what the shift. And I find it, see, I don't believe that anything is accidental. Um, I don't really know what I believe, but this virus is, you know, the, the, I get emotional myself when I think about the number of people who've died because of it. It's, it's just unbelievable. Um, that you can't ever minimize and that has to be remembered but for the for the the survival of of the human race we have to see this as a as a crossroads where we can choose to go that way where we'll survive or that way that's it we'll just we'll just destroy ourselves and that's it it's the end of the human race and that sounds quite fatalist but i i actually think that's that's the choice we're at now. That's that's where we are at as as a as a, a human as a human race. Um, but some people don't know how to make that choice towards survival because they've always they've always been unconscious almost. That they're asleep. They're asleep because we've been conditioned. You know, in in modern society. <sighs> In order to have fully functioning people in society and empowered people, you have to provide the right conditions for that. And where I, you know, I, I believe that yes, your happiness and your, your psychological well-being comes from inside. We can't neglect the fact that your environment and the um, influences within that environment have, do have an effect on whether you become fully functioning or not because the society in which I definitely live goes completely counter to the things we need for psychological functioning and well-being you know we've got marketeers who are making massive profits from our own insecurities our vulnerabilities they that's what their business is based on identifying people's vulnerabilities or insecurities and prizing them wide open and saying, buy my product, buy this product, you'll feel better, you'll look better, people, blah, 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 you'll fit in. And and people are being conditioned to buy into all of that. The social media um, where young people are, it's just a hotbed for mental illness. You know, where they how can you start shifting that? How can, how can we as a people see beyond that and really focus in as to the things that we do need? Or how can we even begin to know what we need? Well, I think the fact that, again, back to the situation we're in, is highlighting what we need. Um, being in isolation and not being able to see your loved ones and being able to hug people and you're standing two meters away in shops and whatever, you ask anybody, what is it you miss most? And inevitably, it's people. It's that closeness, it's the contact, it's the hugs and the love. And, and, it, it's, and what, what, you're, what we're also seeing is people getting back to uh, involving themselves in activities that, that are really good for mental health, like cooking and gardening. I mean, there, there are so many well manicured gardens around at the moment. And, you know, painting, um, reading, because we've slowed ourselves down. We, we're not allowing ourselves to be distracted because there are fewer distractions because we're, you know, we might be working from home or people might be uh, furloughed. I don't know if you've got that scheme in, in the US, the furlough scheme where you're not working for a few weeks. And so you've got time on your hands to actually do the things that you might have neglected because that you never have time. And it, it, it's those kind of things that are making people realize, you know what, I really like this. This is really working for me. But they're the sort of things um, that actually are fertile grounds for 
fully functioning people because it's the creative, the mindful activities. You know, you're gardening, you, you, your hands are in the soil, you're feeling the earth, you're cooking, you, you're mindful, you're in the moment. And it's, it's back to basics, really. Um, how, we, how we keep that going is, is another question because the tendency will be for people the minute they're given the go-ahead will be to run straight back to safety, back to their comfort zone and back to that exact routine that they used to follow before. Because as human beings, that's what we do. But we won't be able to. I mean, I don't think anything will ever be the same after this. I hope it's not. I, I really hope it will never go back to normal because normal was not working. It, 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 you know, there's the, the Krishnamurti quote where it says, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society. And I love that quote because, you know, I lived in New Zealand, now I'm back in the UK. The mental health, this, the mental health statistics in both those countries are pretty similar, pretty shocking. And the fact that people are suffering depression, anxiety, personality disorders, OCD, all kinds of issues, psychological distress, they are symptoms of something. Now, it's easy to just say, oh, you know, just medicate them, put them on medication or give them a bit of CBT or whatever, but you're just putting a band-aid over the problem because the problem is the society also in which these people are expected to thrive. So their, their response, their depression, their anxiety is actually a natural response to an unnatural situation. That's how I see the mental health issues. When clients come to me with depression or whatever might, they might present with, I'm always looking as to what the root cause of that is, because it's, a commun it's communicating something to us. We've got to value depression, we've got to value anxiety. Instead of trying to get rid of it, see it for what it is, it's communication. It's like if you break your leg and your, your leg's hurting, you've got pain, you don't just ignore the pain, you go, oh, I better go and get that checked out, let's go to the hospital, get an x-ray. But with anything psychological like depression, anxiety, whatever else, it's like, oof, let's just pack it away and just carry on and pretend it's not happening or pop a pill and, and it will all be better. We're missing a real opportunity. So if we dive into the opportunity and we really try to figure out what the root is, one, that is scary because you don't know what you're going to find, which is uncharted territory, much like what we're going through right now. But when a yeah. person does decide to dive in because that person really does want to heal and be, you know, not only a better person, but have that chance to really grow and evolve. His, that person's life is going to change all around. We, you know, yeah. friends are going to drop off, you know, hopefully yeah. there will be new friends, but the society he or she knew is going to be completely different. Yeah. And that, and so it just seems like from a small unknown, it keeps growing into a bigger unknown. And so that thinking about that, it is terrifying. You know, Absolutely but, terrifying, Sophia. I mean, it's probably the most terrifying thing you can do, to be fair. So how do you find that courage? That's, you know, that inner strength. I know we, I know we all have it. I mean, it's, it's, as a collective, I know each one of us have a strength and courage, but how do we trust ourselves to learn how to tap into it? You know, how do we know it's okay to explore the unknown? It's a good question. I'm not sure I've actually got the answer for that, you know, Sophia. I used to work with drug addicts and in order for them to go where they didn't want to go, i.e., face what they were avoiding with their drugs, uh, their feelings, their, their self, themselves, etc. And they had to feel enough pain from the drug behavior before they would change. So if I was working with drug addicts and um, I worked in a therapeutic community and sometimes they would relapse and they'd go back to drugs, 
and they'd come to me, oh, I've, I've, I've relapsed, I've, I've used again. I'd go, okay, go away and come back when you when you felt more pain. Because only when they feel pain to such a degree they can't stand it anymore, they will then find the courage to step into the unknown and the darkness. Because it's already dark for them, you know? And that's the pain. But this is a different pain, stepping into the darkness and, and facing the things that, you know, we're talking about the shadow here where we've all got one. Um, sometimes people avoid their shadow for their whole life, but then they die and they never really got to know themselves because we're not just made up of good parts. I don't even like calling them good and bad parts because that's labeling, labeling them. They're just parts. They're all parts of us. And when you cherry pick the ones that are more socially acceptable maybe or more pleasant or more tolerable then you are in, in essence you are rejecting part of yourself you are abandoning part of yourself and that's where when often people clients again talk about their fear of rejection you know that they need to fit in they need to be accepted what they're really talking about is the fact that they reject themselves first that's a real issue that's where i'm that's where i'm going to start with them because that's the core you've already rejected yourself and so you expect others to reject you too because you can't even accept yourself that has to start with you um, so when we when we fragment our self and parts of it break off and go into this hidden shameful place that where we don't want the world to see that's where we've got to go back to we've got to go and look in in the darkness and and face those things that we've been avoiding shame guilt all all of these unpleasant it's painful and it takes courage so whether people have people do have the courage but whether they've got the motivation to to take that journey is another thing. I mean, what do you think, Sophia? What, what do you think would motivate someone to believe that through that pain and that darkness is where the light is? Because that's got to be about, they've never been there. So it's like trust, it's, that is like what it is working with a, ju a drug addict where you go, you say to them, if, if, you, if you kick your habit, if you give up the drugs, you're going to find the happiness that you've been seeking, that you've, that's eluded you so far. But they don't believe you because they've never, ever had it. So they can't be motivated towards something they've never experienced before. Right. So how do we motivate people towards something? Firstly, they might be quite cynical about. There's a lot of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they don't trust that this is going to happen. They think they're going to end up in a worse place. Mm. And they're fearful of going there. There's so much fear. Right. Well, I, th I think this whole situation of this global pandemic, it, it's forcing people to do that. So their behaviors are shifting drastically. All of a sudden, they have to be at home. Um, if they're losing their job, if you know, family members are getting sick, um, or even dying is giving people a chance, like you said, to really slow down, but to really look within themselves, even if they don't want to, um, because everything that they've known has changed or is changing. And then you get politics involved and you get it, you get into things that they normally wouldn't talk about. And so it, but a lot of people also are turning to spirituality turning, going back to prayer, going back to meditation. And I, I think by doing that, they start questioning their own beliefs. You know, if you were raised, if you're a reformed Catholic or you, you don't like what's happening in the church, you know, but you still have your relationship with God or your source, your higher source or your higher self even. Um, so I think those type of relationships are starting, starting with a lot of people who wouldn't have started otherwise, which yeah. is, which is good. And, but I think when people start questioning more, you know, whether it, whether it is politics or they feel so much hatred towards something, it gets to a point where they say, I hope anyway, like, why am I talking like this? You know, and I think it's questions like that, that start people 
on that path? Yeah, that kind of, I think, I mean, I love questions. I mean, questions can change the world if you ask the right questions. Questions are so powerful. Um, once you get someone to start questioning their own beliefs, it's like, wow. You know, you, you've, they've started, because people, again, will avoid that like the plague, excuse the pun, but they will avoid it. it don't touch my beliefs. And that's what all of the anger and the, the power craziness, and they've got to keep these beliefs in solid because if I start dismantling them, then what do I hang, what do I hang off? How am I supposed to operate? How do I see the world? Who am I without these beliefs? But so if people can start questioning their, their beliefs, that's the start. That's the start where they can then start unraveling and, and, but it doesn't have to be like a, taking a big knock and ball to it. It, can, it has to be done very gently because it's, you've got to, you've got to tread gently with the belief thing. Um, but questioning it is the first step to get someone to question what they think, how they behave, what they are believing. That's right. the way forward. Yeah. Or even for a person to realize what, you know, his or her core beliefs are. Because I don't think a lot of people even think about that. You know, they're just... They've never stopped to question. Yeah. They've never stopped to wonder. Because you, your core beliefs are basically driving everything that you do. So if you are not getting the results that you want in your life, then instead of changing what you do, take a look at how you think. You know, again, go right back because what you do is just out there, but what you think is inside. And, and that's why people don't often end up achieving what they say they want because often what they want is in conflict with what they believe they can achieve or what they believe, what they really want deep down, you know? Um, so beliefs are very powerful. And they operate in the subconscious mind. They're just always directing what we do, our choices, our decisions, our behaviors. And a lot of them are un unexamined. People never stop to think, what's my motivation here? What's, what's causing me to make this choice? Why am I doing this? What am I believing about this situation? What other way could I think about it? They just do not. Is that because they have never been taught? Is it because they're afraid? Is it because they're not even conscious about it? Might be all of those things. But it's, that's, that's where the awakening is. You know, that's where kind of blinking into the sunlight, like, wow, I never saw this before. And that's right. what I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about it. Because if we don't grab this right now, I think that's it. We, we are doomed because I never thought that it would take a virus on, on this scale to provide the opportunity that I've been sat waiting for for years and years that I felt we've all needed. This, this completely throwing us off kilter and going, what the what just happened there? Where do I fit in this whole scheme now? And it's taken a virus to do that. But that's the, that's the beauty of life. You never know what's going to happen. You know, at the beginning of 2020, I remember being sitting with my family at New Year's Eve, go, yeah, let's decide what we're going to make this year about. And who would have known? Just like yeah. two, two months later, man. Actually, this is like Mother Nature going, yeah, whatever. You uh -huh. ain't got any control. I'm in control, girl. <laughs> she calls the shots. It's like, get with the program. <laughs> you think you got control, girl? No. And I think that's part of it, realizing, you know, this need for control, this need for certainty, this need for familiarity, the need to know, all of that is really unhealthy. It keeps us very small. It keeps us very stagnant. 
It's just been ripped away from us. And the one lesson in this is things are changing all of the time anyway. The only thing that is certain is that you will die. You don't know when that will be, but that is the only certainty we have in life is that you will die. So if we can become more comfortable with unpleasant feelings, sitting with discomfort, but also learning to embrace change and also sit with uncertainty, sit with not knowing. And instead of fearing it or trying to control it, actually see it as as exciting. You know, it's like getting a Christmas gift. You don't know what's inside. It's exciting. It's not so exciting unwrapping it if you know what's inside. Mine depends on what the gift is. (laughs) But you know, it just gives a different experience of life when you don't know what's ahead. You don't know if you're going to be able to deal with it. You don't know what's going to be thrown in your path. Wow, isn't that amazing? Right. You know, I, and one of the things that I personally, one of, one of the qualities that I really value in myself that sees me through a lot of things is curiosity. My curiosity is the one thing I would hang on to if I had to choose between all of my other qualities or attributes or whatever you call them. It's curiosity. I mean, once once you're curious about things, there's so... it, it, It reduces fear. It's almost like fear doesn't... Fear's trying to get heard. Hey, listen, I'm here. I'm... I'm and it's like, wow, I wonder what this means. What, what might happen here? Curiosity to me is, if we could be more curious, it just shifts. It, it has a different feel to it rather than fearful. Right, and ask, wonder, yeah, to get those questions going, the exploration of yeah. things, yeah. You know, like yeah. a child is curious. Yeah. That The curiosity of a child really want to explore and unravel and and learn about things that they don't understand. Um, so curiosity and apply that curiosity to those unpleasant feelings that people are so desperate to avoid. Instead of fearing those feelings because they're so unfamiliar, you've managed to keep a lid on them for so many years, is to be curious about them, you know, like anxiety. Instead of trying to change that feeling into something else, how about you just sit with it? Just sit with it and, and, and just notice what it feels like. Be curious about how that feels in your body, the sensations that it creates, where in your body you feel it. Does it spread around? If it had a color, what color would you give it? What size is it? What shape? Does it have a texture? Can you make it bigger? Can you make it smaller? And just play with it. You know, we, we've got so many different emotions. We've got, prob- I think it's about 90 different emotions. But the majority of those we spend our life running away from. But if we got curious about them all, then we don't need to fear them. And actually, when we notice we're experiencing one of those feelings or emotions, we can actually check in with it and go, hey, I feel that you, you've come to visit again. What's going on? What are you trying to tell me? That's what they're there for, to communicate with us. And it's a vital part of making choices and, and, and growing as a person is to allow that communication and to receive it rather than silencing it. Yeah. We're missing a real trick here. Yeah, that- <laughs> Yeah, that's key. You, you said right to be open to receive. You know, it, and what's, what's so great about what you just said is like, okay, you can sit with it, but you don't have to judge it. You don't have to hold on to it. You can just like say, okay, this is a part of me. This is, and and you're right, paying attention to where you feel it in your body. I, I think that's how so many diseases manifest is because you're not paying attention and it like sticks on your body. Absolutely. So, it's absolutely. And because because your emotions are so persistent, they are determined to be heard, that if you don't hear them as, a, as an emotion, as a sensation, it will manifest as a physical ailment to get your attention. For sure it does. I, I, I had another client where 
he he came to me and he'd suffered chronic stomach problems for 10 years. He, had, he, he couldn't get out of bed some days. It, it meant he couldn't work. He'd been to uh, specialists. He'd had scans. He'd been to holistic therapists. He'd, he'd been to everybody. And they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Once we started processing and discussing and exploring his anger, mm -hmm. all of, this, all of the, the stomach issues started to release and that's what the problem had been because he recognized he he realized that throughout his childhood he'd never ever been allowed to be angry because his mother and father wouldn't allow it it was not okay to be angry and so he, he stuffed it all away he never processed it it was all still in there determined to be heard and that's what, that's what the, the physical, so again, when people might present and they talk about their physical issues or illnesses, mm -hmm. I'm always curious about, all oh, right, okay, let's, yeah. let's, dis, let's check, check yeah. that out really. You know, what, what could that be communicating to you? Well, what's so interesting about that story too, is if you're able to communicate clearly and you're being heard or you, you feel like you're being heard, um, you don't really ever get to the point of big anger. You know, it's like there's something that you don't like or, you know, you're able to communicate it and like talk about it. And okay, if, so if you get mad for a second, it doesn't linger, it doesn't blow up. So it goes back to how important communication is. It is. And, and being able to, again, sit with unpleasant feelings to notice actually I've got a horrible feeling in my stomach or my muscles are tight right now and my breathing's got a bit rapid. I must be getting angry. And to just recognize that because th there's been research done on how your emotions are actually produced in the body. And it starts up here, but you know, the neurotransmitters, the chemicals are released into the body and they create these physical sensations in the body. Um, whether, whether, the good feelings or bad feelings, there's different neurotransmitters for that. But people re react, they react to the sensations, that tightening in the stomach or that you know, clenching, they react and they continue the cycle of the thoughts that are, uh, right, I'm gonna, uh, and they build on the anger, which then releases more neurotransmitters in the body and then the clenching and their tension. And so there's nowhere for these these chemicals to disperse and, and flow through, they, they, they're storing them. And yet, if they were to just breathe, and that's why they tell you to count to 10 or breathe, it allows your body to regulate itself again. And it allows those chemicals to, to naturally disperse as they're supposed to, instead of we create this kind of mountain of anger and end up with rage and, and then we wonder how we got there. But we need to be educated. We need to be taught how that happens. That's what I used to do in schools because I realised that when I worked, I worked in a prison in New Zealand, um, the maximum security male prison. And I used to teach emotional intelligence and mindfulness to, to the prisoners. And they've never had anything like that before, but it made me realize, wow, there's something in this. Because in my classes, they would say to me, uh, miss, why didn't they teach us this in school? Why didn't we know about this? You know, how they can, how they can notice the early stages of getting angry, how they can then deescalate themselves. Nobody taught them. They, they didn't even have vocabulary for their, their emotions. So that got me thinking, okay, if I want to influence and have impact in wider society, i.e. prisons, drug rehabs, etc., if I want to prevent people ending up in these places, I need to go and work in schools where, I, you know, little five-year-old kids was who I used to work with, five to 13-year-olds, and I would teach them about their emotions and how to feel them and how to recognize them and how to respond rather than reacting, you know? And it's so important. We're not taught that in school. Right. And it's something I'm really passionate about because 
what we are taught in school often doesn't really have relevance to our, our modern life. We need to be teaching children what they need to learn to thrive as human beings. It's like you wouldn't give someone the keys to a Porsche and they don't know how to drive a car or they don't understand how a car works. You know, it's like children have got all of these emotions, which is in, that's, that's what separates us from animals, though I'd argue animals do have emotions most definitely, but we are conscious beings. But nobody teaches them how to use those emotions and make them work for them rather than against them. Right. And, and, and children need to know so that they become fully functioning adults who can then manage their own emotions and use the and, and receive the communication that emotions, that's what they're for. It seems like we're reach on whole new territory because the schools you're right they haven't done that and you look back in the generations and you know how many even a hundred years ago you know that was never a focus it was like you know, even i mean the home ec is not in schools anymore you know no, the basics no. aren't um so but with this pandemic so many people having to learn online you know something like what you're talking about that would be a wonderful thing to learn online or could yeah. it be or i mean would you it, it, well, I, I teach in, in university right now, um, and what the students really, really love, uh, until, we, until the pandemic hit, I was teaching them in lecture theatres, in, in big seminar rooms, and, and I made a conscious decision that my seminars with the students was, were going to push them out of their comfort zone, because again, these are like 18, 19, 20 year old young people. Um, and I'm very, I'm very concerned about that age group right now because they seem to, um, I don't want to generalize here, I'm just going on the students that I work with, their confidence, their self-confidence is very low, their self-belief is very low. They don't know who they are. And, and I really think it's important that they start to, well, that's where they need to start. They're embarking on this, you know, university life, get a de degree qualification and then start a career, but they haven't got the foundations in place. They don't know who they are. They don't know how they operate. They don't know what their strengths are. They don't know what their, how they feel, think, all of this stuff. So I created a whole seminar series and one of the, the things that are consistent in every one of those seminars is that I'm going to put those students out of their comfort zone. And I'm, I get them doing exercises in the, you know, an example might be, okay, there might be 75 students in the room. I get, I say, okay, get up. I want you to walk around and introduce yourself to, to maybe five new people. You look them in the eye, you shake the hand, you say something about yourself and smile. And you can see their faces, it's like, oh, oh, but they do it. And then I also give them mindfulness exercises. I'll maybe do a guided visualization or I'll have them jumping up and down doing star jumps and then drop to the floor and I get them to feel a heartbeat, notice their breathing and then take them into their bodies. And then, I, you know, maybe 20 minutes just do kind of on that subconscious level talking to them. And I give them feedback sheets at the end and, and I get them to say what worked, what didn't, what they liked. And without a doubt, it's the things that stretch them, that put them out of their comfort zone and the mindfulness exercises. So the things that they're, they're most resistant to are the things that they find have the most value for them. And, and that just reaffirms to me what our young people need to know, what, what we need to be teaching them in order for them to thrive in this uncertain world. And I think the necessity is now more so for this emotional education because the world is changing so fast, Sophia. You know, for maybe since, I don't know, since the 1940s up until 2000, and 2000 it was pretty, pretty static. You know, yeah, there was technological advancements, but Man, in the last 20 years, boom, 
And now, 2020, it is unrecognisable. Mm. And this just highlights what skills, what attributes, what traits people are going to need to actually just, never mind, never mind thrive and succeed, but just to survive. They're going to need the skills of survival where they can be flexible, they can sit with uncertainty, they can problem solve, they can um, look at things in a different way and find solutions, they can remain calm in a crisis. All of those things are going to be essential. It, it just, you know, and, and that's the difference. The world up until the past 20 years has not really changed that much, but it's going at such a rate now we're not equipped for it. We're not emotionally equipped to keep up with it because we've been almost educated and conditioned to be in a career for, for one career for your whole life. You go to a job and you, you work the job. That's not the case anymore. You, you know that. You do multiple things. Yeah. yeah, multiple yeah. things. Portfolio work, and I'm on, yeah. I'm on my second, third career. Right. You're right. You have to be flexible. You, um, well, I thought it was interesting when you're talking about your seminar and you had people meeting each other, you know, that, that fear. And this generation has grown up on cell phones, you know, yeah. so many, so many times I've seen people in the, you know, outdoors in the mall or when we were able to do that, you know, in a group, everyone's on their cell phone. So they're not connecting, but they're connecting with a handheld. And so it's interesting. Now we're being forced to connect via the machine, yeah. <laughs> um, which is so ironic because when we had a chance to connect in person, we didn't use it. Yes. But the importance of connection in person, I, I, I feel is important. I, I think we need that human touch and that connection. How can we go out and connect with people we don't know without being in person? Is that even possible? Yeah, because when you are face to face with someone, person to person, the communication is so different to when you're through a screen because there's energy, there's a vibe, you know, you can tune in, you get a sense of, there's all those um, ways. Body language, yeah. Body language. I mean, verbal, verbal communication is only 7% of communication anyway. The words that we use are only 7%. And, and the rest of it is, is like, yeah, body language, facial gestures, uh, it can be the energy, you know, looking right into someone's eyes will tell you whether they're being congruent or not because the eyes, they don't lie, you know? Um, so how we, how we get people to connect through screens, it's, oh man, I hope it doesn't, I, I hope this is not the way it's gonna be going forward and, and that we don't get this opportunity to, to reconnect as people because it does make you so grateful for that. You know, it's, it's, there's some, it's a transfer of energy. You know, when mm. you give someone a hug or you, you touch mm. someone, it's right. that energy that is missing when you through a screen that, right. that's some, that it's not tangible. You can't describe it really. It's, yeah. it's something that's, people need that i mean it's and, essential you know, yeah that that is essential you know i it's agree it's essential but you know you mentioned all of the young people in groups on cell phones um it's the cell phone again is a strategy it's it's allowing them to avoid something it's allowing them to avoid the discomfort of having to strike up a conversation maybe with the person next to them. It's allowing them to avoid the, the, uh, the uneasiness of standing there with nothing to say. It, it's a comfort blanket. And, right. you know, in my seminars, I, I, I made them put their phones away because and then we would discuss why I'd done that. And, and I'd start a discussion about, okay, when you pull out your phone, I saw you all sat around that table. Why were you on your phone? Let's have a discussion. And it encourages them to actually recognize in themselves that it's a form of avoidance. It's a comfort blanket, those phones. And it also allows them to distract themselves if something's coming up for them. You know, it, it's again, 
avoiding feelings and finding ways of distraction. So cell phones are on, on the same level as overeating, uh, alcohol abuse, drug taking, whatever. And that's what addictions are really. It doesn't matter what your substance is or your strategy of avoidance. Um, you know, it's, it's not about the drug or the phone or the, the gambling or whatever it might be. It's about what are you avoiding? What is the feeling that you are feeling before the need to reach for your phone? Is it boredom? Is it discomfort? What is the feeling before you're reaching for that phone? Yeah. And that's where the mindfulness comes in and being aware and, and teaching people what was happening just before you thought, oh, I'm going to open a bottle of wine or I'm going to eat that chocolate cake in the fridge. What was happening just before then? What feelings were you avoiding? Yeah, and that's, that's always a great way to kind of learn about what you are running away from. Right. But of course, you know, when you see that piece of chocolate cake in your refrigerator and you're tired and you don't feel like That's cooking. probably not a good example because I'm a alcoholic. <laughs> but I understand my motivation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything in balance, right? You have to learn balance. <laughs> balance, yeah, balance. Um, but you can't know balance until you know this other stuff, though. You have to, you have to dive in so you can know what your balance is, right? Yeah. So that you can then be aware, be mindful. It's that awareness, isn't it? When we're aware, we can make conscious choices then. And if I want to eat the whole of that chocolate cake, I'm making a conscious choice. I'm not doing it unconsciously right. because something's in my unconscious driving me to eat that cake to, to make me feel better. Right. I'm eating that cake because I want to eat that cake. Taste the chocolate. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, where this will all end, I mean, what, what's, I, I, I sit thinking, okay, how can I, how can I use this opportunity? And it's almost like, I feel like there's a, just a small window of opportunity before people do get sucked back into their normal ways of living, you know? Yeah. It's like, I'm almost not panicking, but there's almost an urgency about, okay, what can, what can I, who can I rally around? Who can I get involved to, to capture people before they get sucked back into it? That small window of opportunity between, I don't know, lockdown finishing and everything starting to open up again before we've lost everyone again, you know? Well, you talking with me, is a start. It is I a thank start. You so, much. so I mean, what you're doing, Sophia, is it, it, you're doing your bit. You're actually putting things out there for people to consider, yeah, to contemplate, know, and to you know, contemplate think about whatever it. they take away from things, or maybe maybe it's just one thing. Maybe you don't know, but it's right. just getting people to consider things, maybe in a different way. Or like you said earlier, to question questioning right. things not just their own beliefs but questioning our leaders and challenging what's really frustrating me now and i said i didn't want to get into politics but i, I mean this in a general sense is how people again i am generalizing appear to be very passive when they see things that are unacceptable going on, they're very passive, like bystanders, instead of challenging and confronting. And there's oh. been, in the UK, there's been a couple of um, uh, people in the media on, on TV who have dared to challenge the politicians. And they've been actually, there's been complaints put in about these people challenging the politicians. And I'm sat thinking, I don't get it. Right. Of course they deserve to be challenged because we need answers. We need the rationale. We need where they're coming from so we can make sense of the decisions they're making and they need to be held accountable. But there doesn't seem to be any, anybody willing to right. hold, hold people accountable. It's, it's just too passive. Is that because people are sleepwalking? Are we so easily brainwashed and influenced Gaslighting is my favorite word right now. Right. Yeah. You know, well I, well, I think that goes back to what we were talking about, people being afraid 
if they, if they can't yeah. face their old their own selves how are they going to face something so enormous you know well, they and have that inner strength that it takes to challenge someone or to confront someone or, or call them on their bullshit or whatever you need to have a, a kind of strong sense of self in order to do that and i wonder if that's what's missing increasingly so in in the society in the population that inner you know that inner strength that inner knowing that you know when you're really grounded and you're solid in who you are and you will say you will you will speak your truth to speak the truth yeah but then you do that and then someone pulls out a gun and shoots you you know and and you see that all you know it's like you hear these stories you know people get all riled up and scared and then they shoot people. It's like, oops, wrong person. You know, it, it goes yeah. back. To, and that's you know, the real fear. You know, there's this, this fear based in, um, what's the word? Unrealistic fears. But right. when there's more and more people carrying guns or knives, then that's a genuine fear. And that has to be considered because it's about keeping you alive. You know, the fear, right. the survival fear is, is a fear that's, can't be just shoved away because if that's the case then where does that leave us if we're not able to challenge right the fear of being shot or stabbed or whatever yeah that's terrifying that's it's, why it, it, and it goes back to you have to know that you, you know in the bible every single religion they all say know thyself you know exactly. why are we so afraid to know who we are that's right you know well, what what do we think we're going to find? Yeah, and then and then if there is if there is stuff that we don't like, we have to learn how to forgive it. We have to learn how to work through it. We learn we need to learn how to take responsibility for ourselves. Yeah. So then, when we're faced with issues where we need to stand up to something that's not right, we have the courage to do it. You know, and then we have hopefully people who resonate with what we're doing to support us, as opposed to taking out a gun and shooting us. Well, you think, <laughs> Sophie, if more people were able to do that, then there'd be less people carrying the guns or feel the need to carry guns. So, exactly. It, you know, it has that ripple effect. If exactly. more people could go where they don't want to go, there's no need for the guns because the guns, again, is, is well, that's a whole psychology in yeah. itself why people carry guns, isn't it? But... <sighs> it's these are definitely changing times and you're right. They are exciting times and they are terrifying because we're dealing with so many unvariables or <laughs> I can't even say the word. I can't speak, but I get so passionate about it because we all have so much potential to do so much good. And yet people, you know, they don't have the self-esteem. They don't have, you know, they, they feel that, Oh, my mom needed to love me. My dad needed to support me. Well, I'm sorry. Fuck that. You know, yeah. you are who you are, yeah. deal with it, learn who you are, you know, take a stand, embrace yourself, you know, the ugly and the pretty, I mean, just dive in and say, this is me, you know, Absolutely. and if you don't like it, I don't care because I'm learning to like myself. I'm learning to love myself. And if I do that, you can do that. Yeah. We're all learning to do that because there are parts right. of us that we, we, we despise, but unless we accept those parts, we can't ever love ourselves right. completely. We'll always be disconnected. And it's that sense of disconnection that, you know, is, is really, in my opinion, the, the cause of a lot of the mental health issues, full stop. Yeah. It's disconnection with self because you've, you've rejected part of yourself unconsciously. This is not a conscious thing, but it's unconsciously. So you, you look for, you look for that, you look to fill that hole in all of the things that were already spoken about in the chocolate cake, in the, in the bottle of wine, in the whatever, in the whatever. You look in to fill that hole when only you can fill it by accepting yourself completely, warts and all. Right. You know, you don't have to like those parts. You just have to accept them and maybe have a bit of compassion for them, you know, and, and kind of, are they really bad or have you just judged them as bad because you are told they're bad by society or by your, your parents or by your peers or by your teachers. And that's how we break those parts away from us. Usually in early life, we've either been shamed or humiliated or something equally unpleasant. And we decide that part doesn't work for me. I'm going to have to be this other part. And we put those masks on. 
Oh, God. Yeah, now we're literally putting masks on. Yeah, how right. many masks do we wear? I mean, we've got a mask for every minute of the day or whatever situation you're in, and it's exhausting. Because who do you, how do you know who you're supposed to be in a different situation with different people if you're wearing masks? Just put the bloody masks down, be yourself, and if people don't like you, that's too bad. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Exactly. But again, that takes courage because there's a chance of rejection there. Yeah. And, and, and not fitting in and not belonging. And that's what we all want as hu being human. We want to belong. We want to be accepted. Yeah. But we're going about it the wrong way. Yep, this is true. But we have the choice to change it. We need to be aware that we have the choice, don't we? You're aware, I'm aware. But how do we make other people aware that they have a choice? Because if they realize they have a choice, they are then responsible. They can't blame someone else. Right. So that's a scary thing. There's a lot of fear, isn't there? Everything we're talking about goes back to fear and needing courage. To be responsible for your own choices and your own feelings or if things aren't working. Right. So you just have to make fear work for you. Yeah, you know, you have to make use friends with fear. Yeah. Make friends with fear, look it in the face and don't let it stop you because that's what stops everybody, fear. Right. It really is. Yeah. We, we are definitely at a turning point. We are definitely at a turning point. I'm just, I'm just yeah. curious as to how it's all going to unfold. You know, um, this time next year, I don't know what we're going to be looking back, back on. Even a couple of months from now. <laughs> Look how much has changed <laughs> yeah, in two right. months. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. It, it seems like every week is something new. You know, it's just, wow. And we just got to surf those waves. I just play the day in front of me. That's my phrase mm -hmm. right now. I'm just playing the day in front of me because I can't think any further than that. Right. And being a coach where... Technically, coaches are supposed to set goals with people. I prefer not to do that anyway, but generally, coaches are supposed to set goals with people. The only goals I'm setting with people are intrinsic goals. I can't be setting goals out there with them because nobody knows what out there is going to look like. Right. So whether those goals would be achievable, nobody would know. So they're not realistic. So setting those intrinsic goals are more within that person's control. So what kind of goals are you setting or helping people set? So speaking their truth, having the courage to, to voice and show who they really are. Oh, that's huge. Um, it's huge. It's huge. So that's, that's a common one at the moment. Well, not just now, but it always has been. But I've always been more interested in the intrinsic goals because if they are not, if they are not um, met, then the, the extrinsic ones will always be empty and hollow and, and that satisfaction you feel from achieving them will never be there. You'll always be on the next thing and the next and the next. So right. those intrinsic goals, you know, reintegration of your parts that's another thing that's another goal i work with people on reintegration and a good way to do that is through hypnosis hypnotherapy because it's then much gentler it's less it's less scary and we speak to the parts and ask what their parts what their their purpose is and what they want to achieve and we try and reconcile the good part and the bad part because sometimes more often than not the two parts want the same thing and so when you can reconcile those parts and you see someone actually feel it in their own body where it's integrated. I had, I had a lady where she felt it in her heart. She felt, and I could see the moment when she'd integrated it and the tears just streamed down her face. And it was like, it was, it was just... I could see it. I could see it happen, even though it's, it's, it's a thing that you can't explain. Right. So yeah, reintegration of parts, speaking my truth, um, being, being daring to feel, learning how to feel. That's another one. And again, sometimes 
hypnosis is is very effective for that there was again another girl i work with she totally shut down all of her feelings completely mm. shut down because she she'd experienced trauma her one of her parents had died when they were on holiday mm. and they had to fly the parents body back and from that point she had just shut down switched off couldn't feel couldn't feel joy couldn't feel sadness and so I, I use hypnotherapy to reintroduce feelings to her in a very gentle way. So they weren't threatening. Um, we started with pleasant ones and then noticing the sensations while she was in trance. So it was all in the subconscious, but she could, she could feel it. And she was talking to me and expressing what, what sensation she was experiencing. And it was really effective. We built it up like that. And I, I realized we turned a corner because she sent me an email one, one day and in that email, there was lots of references to, I feel this, and yesterday I was so excited to do it. And I thought, wow, her vocabulary has changed. That shows she's turned a corner. And that was it. She was off. It was nice. like unlocking it all again. You know? Is hypnotherapy something you can do online? Like, or is it's, it something you have to do in person? Yeah, it can be done online. I prefer to do it with, the person in front of me because hypnotherapy for the therapist is about being able to pick up on those micro movements knowing when the client is at their peak ready to go into trance mm -hmm. and actually being able to accommodate that you can't do that through a screen it's all it's like their skin the, the pallor of their skin changes, their lips can get fuller, the, the slight physiological changes that you miss through a screen. So I prefer doing it with someone in front of me. Oh, wow. Um, but that's not to say it can't be affected to some level through a screen because, um, you know, hypnotherapy is only about using the subconscious mind, accessing it while the client is in a highly relaxed State. because if you imagine your subconscious mind is like it's like uh the vault to a bank it's got security guards you're not getting in here this is too precious so we don't want anybody wandering in there so the security guards don't let let you into the subconscious mind but when someone is in trance the security guards are asleep you can get in there you can access the subconscious mind where all those beliefs are and all those limiting ideas and disempowering decisions they've made about themselves, etc. And you can rewrite a script. You can, you can recondition them or, or rather uncondition them. That's what I prefer, uncondition them to, to be able to function in a way that's much more empowering for them. And when someone's under a trance like that, are they consciously aware of anything or are they? Yeah, okay. yeah so they're they, aware. They, it's a strange state to be in. I've done, I've done past life regression. And when I was regressed, I went back to 1595 and I was, I was a boy. But while I was in 1595 in the forests of Northern Scandinavia, I could also hear the clock in the room in, 19, uh, in 2017. And I was aware of being in two worlds and it was a very strange sensation. Wow. And that's where my curiosity, I mean, man, mm -hmm. no wonder I went into hypnotherapy. I was so curious. How can that be? I'm in 2017, I can hear the clock, but I'm also back in 1595 in a forest. Wow. It's amazing. That is, that is amazing. Do you, have you, do you do past life regression on your clients? I, I've done it once or twice. I don't promote it as, as um, I don't promote it as a service. I, if someone asks for it, I'll, I'll kind of check out their reasons for, because I, I don't know whether I'm always, I'm always conscious about their motivation for wanting to do it really. Um, but it's not something I'm, I'm highly practiced in. I have done it once or twice. I prefer to use um, hypnotherapy in conjunction with psychotherapy and coaching because hypnotherapy kind of gets right to the roots and, and it can kind of rip out those stubborn roots that maybe psychotherapy doesn't quite, you know, maybe there's some resistance there from the client 
and they're yeah. clinging on to something because of fear, usually. Um, hypnotherapy can just clean it all up and, and kind of create that, that good foundation. I, th I think it's great how there are so many different modalities to help, you know, you help someone to get to the roots. You know, it's like not just one way, you know, it's but I exploring think the different ways. It tends to be a common thread in all of them, in all of the different mm -hmm. methods of, of essentially achieving the same thing. I think that there might be common threads. It's about, sometimes it's about unblocking, you know, unblocking is a common thing in most of what all of these therapies or methods uh, aim to do is unblocking because we're all energy channels. And when the energy channel is blocked, we can't, we can't flow. Um, right. And that's, that's the main purpose, that unblocking. Yeah. How the unblocking happens is incidental, really. I guess it depends on what the client's preference is. Right. Be in the flow. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. so great. You are so wonderful, Lynn. Thank you so very much for your time. I mean, You're very we've already talked for over an hour. It's like, where yeah, did the right. time go? It's yeah. like, <laughs> it just, you know, you're so, so interesting and so fascinating and you, you provide such a great service and I am truly grateful. Thank you. You're very welcome, Sophia. It was great to talk to you and thank you for your time. Now your website, lynnwaldercoaching.com. lynnwaldercoaching.com. Yeah. Okay. All right, and and even if you don't live in the UK, people can still reach out to you. Oh yeah, I, I, I've still got clients all over the, the globe because I, I use Zoom or Skype or whatever, because I used to live in New Zealand anyway, so it's kind of, it's huh. essential. And we're, we're, we're a global community anyway. I mean, it's, this I can both people face to face, but that's not really practical. I live in a little village in the outskirts of Nottingham. So, you know, my client base isn't basically in my little village. So yeah, anybody, it's, it's global, international. And I love that. That's so exciting. You're in a different country. You know, it's just I love it. I and mean, that's why technology is amazing. The fact that we yeah. can speak like this and you're in morning time and I'm in the evening. Right. This is great. So I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And I, um, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you, right. Sophia. Bye. Bye. Let's see.